Hey, I'm wondering how many of you remember the time when you gave your life to the Lord and you accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Do you remember how you felt inside? Uh, kind of on fire, really? So let me ask you a question. What do you do, listen, what do you do when your spiritual fire begins to flicker? I know we've had that happen. Somebody has had that happen in their life at one time or another. It kind of flame kind of feels like it's kind of dimming down and, and it starts to flicker. Flicker to the point where it's about to go out. Have you ever felt that way, that your flame was just about to be extinguished? And um, I know there's been a time or two in my life when, when I felt that, that way. And it, at one point, it felt like that flame was just barely flickering, just barely flickering. And that was a pretty dark and heavy time in my life. So, uh, so what happened that caused that flame to be rekindled, to be reflamed? That's the title of our message this morning, Reflaming the Flame. I discovered that on my uh, spiritual journey, in order to have a faithful finish in this voyage that we're on in our spiritual life, there were four things that I needed to do to get that spiritual fire burning again, <clears throat> to, to reflame the, the flame. This morning we're continuing our study of the book of 2 Timothy and we're going to be looking at verses in chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Let me read those verses for you and then I want to share what uh, the Apostle Paul did. This is his second letter to Timothy, by the way, and uh, he wrote it while he was a a prisoner. Uh, uh, some say it was a maritime prison in Rome, and he was a prisoner there. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about four things that we must do to continue uh, rekindling that spiritual flame uh, in order to have a faithful finish on our spiritual journey. Listen to what uh, Paul wrote to, to young Timothy. Remember, Timothy, as I mentioned last week, Timothy was a uh, a leader in the church at Ephesus, <clears throat> a very young uh, uh, person. So Paul writes to Timothy beginning <clears throat> in verse 6. He says, Therefore I, I remind you uh, to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. <clears throat> but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Verse 11 says, To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul is listing four things, or Paul gives four things here that we need to do in order <clears throat> to continually rekindle that, uh, that flame, that spiritual flame in us. First one is this. If you have your notes uh, there, you'll notice number one uh, starts out with remember our. So remember our spiritual gifts. Remember our spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Look what he says in verse 6. Therefore I remind you 
I remind you, Timothy, to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And that word, therefore, ties in the previous uh, verse which refers to Timothy's genuine faith. He's because of that genuine faith that you have, Timothy. I want to remind you that you need to stir up that spiritual gift that is in you. Paul is saying because of that genuine, that sincere faith, stir up that gift that was given to you by the laying on of my hands. When, when God saves us, the point that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when God saves us, He gives each one of us spiritual gifts. He, he, the Holy Spirit comes to reside within us. So the Bible says, know you not that your body is a temple of the living God? The Holy Spirit's living inside of you if you're a child of God. And He gives each one of us <clears throat> spiritual gifts in order to accomplish God's purpose in our lives. That Greek word <clears throat> translated stir up, it's in the present tense. So it may, it's a continual action. Continue to rekindle the flame. Continue to stir up that gift that's in you. <clears throat> it's with, uh, just like a fire uh, that has to be constantly stirred and refueled. I remember uh, many times as a, as a teenager when I was in a youth group at, at a church in Florida, we'd go out once in a while our youth, whole youth group would go down to the beach and the sand dunes. They had beautiful sand dunes there on the Florida beach there. And we'd go in the sand and we'd, we'd build a big fire. And, uh, every, you know, we'd sit there and build a fire and, and uh, pretty soon that fire would start to die down. And somebody had to go and stir it up, put some more wood on it to keep it, keep it burning. And it's just like that fire that needs to be constantly stirred and, and refueled, so must our spiritual gifts if they are to continually burn with energy and with power. Paul is encouraging Timothy to stir up the gift of God which is in you. That Greek word gift is from the is, uh, charisma. Charisma. It refers to spiritual gifts that has been given by the Holy Spirit. And there it's given to us in order to equip us for God's purpose. Every, every Christian, every Christian has received one gift at least <clears throat> from the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the last part of verse 7, he says, But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in that. We don't all have exactly the same gift. We have, there's varying gifts. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit uh, gives those gifts to us as He wishes. Not according to what we want. God knows what's best for us, so He gives each one of us. And we, we don't have all the gifts, but, but there are some gifts. We, we may have several, but there are some gifts that are predominant. You know, the gift of... Uh, Teaching, the gift of hospitality, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving, the gift of, of uh, pastor-teacher, uh, the gift of apostleship, the gift of prophecy. That those, those are gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that He gives according to His purpose. And, and uh, it's, they're called grace gifts, charisma gifts. So listen, folks, when you hear about, and I've heard this so many times in the past, all oh, those charismatics. Have you heard that before? You know, those charismatics, they're just really kind of crazy. I'm going to tell you something. If you're a child of God, you're charismatic. You know that? You have the charisma, the charismatic gift in you. So we're all, if we are all truly genuine children of God, we have God's Holy Spirit within us, we've been given spiritual gifts, then we're charismatic. Think about that. Y'all look like that's a surprise? 
That's what, that, that's what it means there. That's what that word gift means, charisma. You're full of charisma. Yeah. So when you see those quote-unquote folks from the kind of the, I don't know what, you, the Pentecostal movement or whatever it is, you know, we'd say, oh, you're just full of, just look at them and say, you're full of charisma. So am I. If you've got the Holy Spirit living in you and He's given you that spiritual gift. And if we are to fulfill God's purpose for our lives, we need to discover and develop and use our spiritual gifts. How many of you know what your spiritual gift really is? Anybody? Know what your spiritual gift is? There's a few. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Shame on me as your pastor. We're going to have a class on spiritual gifts. We're going to teach about spiritual gifts. We did that in uh, uh, the church in Eagle Point one year. I don't know. You were there, Fred. You remember we had about 65 people in that class on a Sunday morning, and it lasted about 13 weeks, and we went through the spiritual gifts front to back. And uh, we had folks coming out of there saying, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that I had that gift. And then they started developing that gift. And, and now I see some of them are using that gift that they've had uh, there at the church. So uh, we, need to, we need to, first of all, discover what our spiritual gift is. And we need to, to use it to, to uh, uh, develop that spiritual gift. And then we need to use that spiritual gift for God's purpose. The Bible says uh, for edifying the body of Christ. There should be a desire, just like a blazing fire within us to, uh, to I call it the three Ds, to discover, develop, and deploy your spiritual gift. <clears throat> All Christians need to make a conscientious effort to exercise their gifts, and it's done for the common good of the body of Christ. In fact, the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given each one, listen, for the profit of all. God didn't give you a spiritual gift for you to hoard it to yourself and enjoy it yourself or anything. He gave you spiritual gifts for the profit of all to be utilized to, to build up the body of Christ. We stir up, listen, we stir up our spiritual gifts, gift of God by discovering what it is, by developing it, and by using it for God's purpose. So how do we use our gifts? How do we use those, that spiritual gift? Well, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter wrote... Uh, that uh, uh, epistle of Peter, the letter that he wrote. And according to, uh, to, to Peter, he says this, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God gave us spiritual gifts to be used to, what, minister to one another. We're all ministers and we're to be ministering that gift to one another. When we forget to do that, then our spiritual flame flickers, starts to die down. So Paul reminds Timothy of his spiritual gift. He says, stir up that spiritual gift that's within you. He says, that spiritual gift that was given you by the laying on of my hands... Now, that could be a reference to uh, Paul, to uh, Timothy's ordination. Whenever a, uh, a, a person is ordained into the gospel ministry as a, as a minister, as a pastor or something, the, uh, other uh, elders and pastors gather around, they lay hands on them and they pray for it. And th that may refer to that, or it could be uh, the laying on of hands. Uh, could be that time. 
Paul really was a mentor, if you will, or a spiritual father of Timothy. So it could be that when, of course, Timothy had his ordination, Paul probably sat on that ordaining council with him. So we want to reflame that uh, spiritual flame within us. We've got to remember our spiritual gifts. Not only that, but we also, number two, have to recognize our God-given resources. Recognize our God-given resources. <clears throat> Paul continues in verse 7. In fact, verse 7 is one of my favorite verses. I like verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of, of power and of love and of a sound mind. I think sometimes we get tired and our enthusiasm for serving, serving the Lord kind of gets lost a little bit. And that happens really because of opposition comes before us. At times we might feel intimidated. We might feel helpless. That's what Paul called the spirit of fear. Sometimes that spirit of fear may come upon us. I think that is one of Satan's most effective weapons in quenching your spiritual flame. Fear. Fear. Someone once said uh, that uh, gave a, a, a great acrostic for the word fear uh, that, that, and for that fear that's planted in our hearts. They said this, uh, fear is this, fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. And that's what the devil does. He He's a liar. He's a father of lies. He throws those lies at you and, and, and gives you that false evidence. And it, appear, it, it appears to be real, but it's not. And then pretty soon there's the fear that builds up within us. And what that really is, is, is you know, sometimes we, we fear that we've lost the ability to use our spiritual gifts. And so that what that is really is a lack of spiritual self-confidence. There's a parable that Jesus that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25 verse 14 through 30. It's about a man that took a journey, went on a long journey. And what he did was before he left, <clears throat> he entrusted uh, his uh, three servants that he had with all of his property, with his property. And, and to one of them, he gave five talents. And to another, he gave three talents. To another, he gave one talent. And sometime later, he'd been gone for a while. And sometime later, he came back and he called his servants together and he wanted an accounting. <clears throat> what did you do with uh, that that I gave to you to, to take care of? And... Uh, uh, the first two servants, they doubled his talents. The one he gave five to had ten. The one he gave three, three to had six. And uh, the third servant had gone out and buried that one talent, talent. And he buried it in the ground. Now, listen to what he told his master, the reason that he hid that talent. He says, and I was afraid. And went and hid your talent in the ground. That servant had a spirit of fear. And a spirit of fear will cause you to bury your spiritual gift. The gifts and talents that God has given you, you have that spirit of fear, it's going to cause you to bury it, but not, not use it. I think the spirit of fear is also seen in the lives of the Israelites as they, they came to the border of the promised land that God had given them. Remember, they sent out 12 spies. And they, uh, uh, the 12 spies went out and they came back and there's two reports given. There was what I call the majority report and the minority report. In the majority report, the 10 spies came out and... Uh, uh, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, they, 
Here's what they said. And there we saw the giants. And they were like grasshoppers, and, and, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. You know what they did? They developed grasshopper vision. To them, they were just as tiny little grasshoppers against those big giants. When we develop grasshopper vision or a grasshopper mentality, it's an indication that we have that spirit of fear. And that's the result of forgetting God's resources that he has given us to use his spiritual gifts effectively. I think the best way, the best way of combating that grasshopper feeling that comes up sometimes is to remember 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which tells us that God has given us three great resources. We need to, to, uh, to recognize these resources. The first one is this. God has given us a spirit of power. Look at what it says in verse 7. Verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? That's the negative. He's not given us a spirit of fear. But now we, we look at the positive. Remember one time I told you in your life you need to, uh, and, and, and I got this from somebody else. It's not mine originally, but he said that we need to uh, eliminate the negative and accentuate the positive. And so now he says, God has not given us that spirit of fear. That's the negative. But he has given us, here's the positive, he has given us the, a spirit of power. That word power is from the Greek word dunamis. Dunamis. We get our English word dynamite or dynamic from that. It's a reference to some great force, great energy. God gives us his empowering grace. That is the power to effectively use our spiritual gifts and to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Paul in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 describes his power when he writes this. He says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. If we have the Holy Spirit, we have the power. And there's nothing more powerful than God. And so if you have God in you, you have the power in you also. He's given us a spirit of power. Secondly, he's given us a spirit of love. Spirit of love. That word love is from the Greek word agape. Agape. It's a supernatural love. It's not some emotional love. It's not some, some conditional love. You know, I love you if. We don't base our love on one another upon what they can do or not do for us. We base our love upon what Christ has done for us because if we have the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, we have God's love. And we are to express that love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? Huh? Mike, you're my neighbor, right? Jeff, you're my neighbor. Lisa, you're my neighbor. You may live 10 miles down the road, but you're my neighbor. You know, Neetan Sadar is my neighbor. He lives in India, by the way, and that's, that's kind of fun. But hey, who's my neighbor? Look around you. Look around you. We're to love one another. That's what the Bible says. Love one another. And so we're to exercise that spirit of love that God has given us. Agape love means that you love people regardless of who they are and regardless of how they act. Oops. That gets to somebody sometimes, doesn't it? You know, we have a hard time because somebody acts a certain way and we don't like it and we don't want to have anything to do with them. We don't want to hang around them or love them. But uh, Some people, you don't have to hang around them, but you got to love them. 
<clears throat> I've told my daughter once in a while, sometimes I don't like you. I mean, I love you all the time, but sometimes I just don't like you. Isn't that the way it is with us? No, we've we got to love them. God has given us a spirit of power to do what he has put us on earth to do, and it is accompanied with a supernatural ability to love those among whom he has called us to minister. Whether they're believers or whether they're not believers, a lack of love is one thing that will reveal that our spiritual flame is flickering, it's dwindling. When we have a hard, <laughs> when we have a hard time, listen, a hard time expressing love to difficult people in the church, or at work, or in our families, we need to rekindle that flame. <laughs> Of our spirit, we need to rekindle that spiritual flame. And when the spiritual flame within us is burning fully, I don't think we'll have any trouble at all fulfilling the command that's given us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. Let all that you do be done with love. Let all you do be done with love. Now, do we always do that? Not really. I fell in that. I, I fail in that area sometimes in my life. Then later on, I kick myself in the in the pants, you know. Uh, third thing is this: God has given us a spirit of a sound mind. He's given us a spirit of power. He's given us a spirit of love. He's given us a spirit of a sound mind. What that means is self-control or to be cool-headed. As, as we use the spiritual gifts that God has given us in our lives, and, and, and as we use them the way in which God intends, us, intends for us to use them, that is to build up the body of Christ, the church, we, we should exercise self-control. Acting like a hothead shows that we don't have a sound mind. There's no reason at all to have a spirit of fear. None at all. Spirit of fear is not from God. A spirit of fear is from Satan. God has given us a spirit of power, a spirit of, of love, and a spirit of a sound mind, and we need to utilize that. So in order to rekindle our spiritual flame, we must remember our spiritual gifts. We must recognize our God-given resources. And thirdly, we must rely on the power of God. Look at verse 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. According to the power of God. Knowing that the resources God supplies enables us to, to have a faithful finish in our spiritual journey, Paul tells Timothy this in 2 Timothy, the first part of, of, of verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. According to the commentary that is uh, given in the New King James Study Bible, this is what it has to say about that, and I, and I quote, Timothy is encouraged not to be ashamed or shrink back from the testimony of the Lord. Testimony is the witness of the Lord. The Greek term is the source of our English word martyr. Uh, 
Church tradition says that most of the apostles died as martyrs. Paul is concerned that in the face of vehement opposition, Timothy might be afraid to witness. That happens sometimes when we're under persecution or opposition or something. We're, we're afraid to witness. Maybe, maybe Timothy was wrestling with fear uh, of being arrested and being executed. Uh, certainly the, the threatening execution of the Apostle Paul had an effect on the lives of all believers. Planting fear in their hearts. And that was Nero's attempt. Remember, we said last week, we talked about what happened is that when Rome got burned down, uh, a majority of the city was burned. Then Nero blamed Christians for that. And then he declared Christianity an illegal religion. And, and Christians came under very heavy persecution and uh, tortures and deaths. And, and his intent really was to plant that fear into the hearts of all those Christians. We also should not be uh, ashamed of the testimony of, of the Lord whenever we're in an intimidating situation. Have you ever been in a situation where because of fear, you hope that no one would know that you were a Christian? Have you ever been afraid to speak up about what is right? Have you ever been hesitant to speak up about biblical morality, especially in our world today? See, that, that, is, that is a part of what is called uh, being ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. There are times when the only alternative to being ashamed is to suffer the hardship. Suffer hardship for the kingdom gospel. I think whenever we're tempted, when we're tempted to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, we should remember what Jesus told his disciples. In Luke chapter 9, verse 26, he looked at his disciples and he said, Guys, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and in his fathers and in the holy angels. We should never be ashamed of Christ. We should never be ashamed of other Christians who are open about their faith. Have you ever been around somebody who's just, you know, very open about their faith. I, I go, and, and I used to be this way. My mom, bless her heart, she's like 92 years old this year. And she is a feisty witness for the Lord. I mean, she is in your face with Jesus. <laughs> she'll talk about him. She don't care who you are, stranger, run up against a stranger. She'll talk about her Jesus. And there's been times when we've gone out shopping together and, man, she's just over there talking about Jesus. And I'm saying, oh, Mom, come on. <laughs> Let's go. We should never be ashamed of another Christian when they're expressing their joy, their uh, energy, and their testimony for the Lord. <clears throat> You know, Paul writes that in verse 8. He says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, but then look what he writes, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul says, don't be ashamed, and don't be ashamed of me when I stand up and belt it out. And Paul wasn't ashamed either. He, <laughs> he was tied and changed to, to, to Roman soldiers and he was still preaching the gospel. There are times when we are tempted to be ashamed of a brother or a sister in Christ, maybe with their boldness in expressing their faith or maybe their unwillingness to compromise their convictions. 
And here's the thing. We may not always agree with their convictions or with their methods, but we must appreciate their commitment to the Lord and to the very fact that, listen, we're all part of the same family of God. We're all children of God. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul continues now in verse 8 by writing this. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. See, we do not have to endure those sufferings and the persecution and the ridicule in our own power. But, as Paul states, by the power of God. God's empowering grace. And God's enduring grace is available whenever we need it. Jesus told his disciples that when they're arrested, he said, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. What he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, he says, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Man, when we're, when, when we're being persecuted or being, and the opposition comes, we don't have to worry about what to say or what not to say. All we need to do is rely on the power of God to give us the right words to say. That's why, that's why I pray, and, and, and you've heard me say this before, I pray, God, before I stand before your people, let me stand in the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. Because he's the one that gives us the words to say. And there's been times when I've kind of, I, I try to keep notes, I try to keep, I, I spend time, during the week, just trying to put this all together and, and, and putting it down on paper so that I've got paper because if I don't, and I used to do this, I used to go off on rabbit trails a lot, you know, and then pretty soon we're here longer than what we should be. Actually, not what we should be. We should be here as long as God wants us to be here, but we're here longer than what we could have been. But there are times when, when I've been speaking and, and all of a sudden, whew, the Lord just kind of throws things at me and I say things. And then later on, somebody says, Pastor, you remember? And I said, did I say that? That's because you, you, you allow the Holy Spirit to give you the right words to say and everything. And, and uh, th there's times when I've had that spirit of fear, but I've still had to preach. Man, I was afraid because... <laughs> Here's the thing. I knew there were some folks who would not like what I had to say. And sometimes I, I know that there's some people that are sitting around and I, I know I've got to say it because it's in the Word of God. That's why I like to go through a book of the Bible because you can't skip over anything there. You've got you to gotta go through it. And a lot of preachers that strictly preach on topical issues, they preach the topics they want to and the controversial ones they kind of stay away from. You know, the speaking in tongues and, and uh, the, some of the uh, gifts of the Spirit and some of the other things about they stay away from that kind of stuff. But, man, when you're preaching through a book of the Bible, you, there's, if you skip over it, people know it. Hey, let's go back and talk about that. So and there's times when, when uh, I knew that what I had to say, people were not going to like there were times when I was not thinking of what Jesus had promised about providing me with the power to speak boldly and what needed to be said and, and how to say it. One thing we must never forget, folks, listen. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. You know that? That's what he told the Apostle Paul. For my strength is, uh, is made perfect or, uh, in your weakness. 
we can endure these sufferings uh, for the gospel according to the power of God, which Paul speaks about there in 2 second, in second Timothy. And, and you know why that is? That's because of a promise that we've been given. Paul said this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, Sunday school, one of the things came up about doing things, you know, well, you know, I can't do that. I may not be able to do that. Well, yeah, you're right. You can't do it. You can't do it in your own power. But you can do it in the power of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do it on my own. When we're suffering for the kingdom gospel, when we're being ridiculed, when we are uh, being persecuted, God is, 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 is going to give us that supernatural strength and he's going to do it through his Holy Spirit. Did you know that most Christians never really experience God's power in their lives? Most Christians never really experience that power that God has available for them in their lives. And the reason is, is this, that they're never in the middle of a situation where they need that power. You know why? Because they're just going with the flow. They're going with the flow. They're not movers and shakers. They're not that, that book that, I, that, 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 that we're reading, the, the Roaring Lambs. They're not roaring lambs. They're not like, uh, I think it was David Platt that came out with a book, uh, Radical Christianity, being radical in your, in your Christian faith. Or, or there's one that says, not a fan. I'm not a fan. You know, some people are spectators. And they're really not getting into the, into the game itself. And when you don't do that, you can sit back and relax. Because you're not really experiencing God's power because you don't need God's power at that, at that point because you're not doing anything. And when you feel attacked by the devil, when you really feel you're being attacked, know this, you're doing something that's got his attention. And when you're sitting, everything's going hunky-dory and you're sitting back and it's just a good old time and man, I just, I just never get these problems. I just never suffer this or that or the other. And you know, Satan's not attacking you because he doesn't need to. You're already in his camp. Be a mover or a shaker for the Lord. Defend the faith when it is attacked by the ungodly. What was it? I was reading uh, about uh, someone had, had said something uh, about God, oh, what, what, some speech that he was given or something about, about God on drugs, God taking drugs. Remember that? I can't remember where that is now. And I says, Man, I'll tell you what, is if, if I was ever in a conversation and somebody said that, I would stand up and challenge them right then and there. I don't care who was around. Defend the faith. That's what the Bible says. Earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Don't, don't fear what the world can do to you. You better fear what God can do to you. Because he can do a whole lot worse than what man can do. We need to stand up and defend the faith when it is attacked by the ungodly. Whenever you stand for God's word and, and endure suffering in whatever form because of the kingdom gospel, you're going to experience a supernatural power of God in your life and you're going to receive his blessing in your life. But that... that Supernatural power and his blessings is reserved for those who are not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord and are suffering for righteousness and are being persecuted and reviled against for the Lord's sake. In fact, Jesus told his disciples there in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he was 
teaching his disciples, and he said to them, he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. See, I've heard this people coming from their jobs and saying, I've been persecuted in my job because of my religion, because of my Christianity, because of, because of the Lord. And when come to find out, it's no, because they've been a sloppy employee. They're not suffering for the Lord's sake. They're suffering for their own sake. And the Bible says that God will bless us and give us that supernatural power when we're coming under attack for his sake, for righteousness' sake. And then the fourth thing that we must do in order to rekindle that flame is to review our salvation. We need to review our salvation. Look at verses 9 and 10. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When our spiritual flame begins to fade, Paul points out in verse 9 that we must remember who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Why did God save you and why did God save me? We were saved, listen, we were saved in order to live a holy life in a dark and sinful world. We were, we were the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 that we were chosen in Christ and should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the first part, it says, we're to, it, it tells us, Paul writes this, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're to let our lights shine in this dark world. That's why we're saved. We're saved that we might have eternal life, but we're saved in, all, in order because, listen, if all God wanted to do was to save us so that we could spend eternity with him, the instant you got saved, he would have taken you out of the world. So why did he leave us here? Because we're to be light in a dark world. We're to be salt in a sour culture. Paul points out in verse 9 that we are saved and called with a holy, a holy calling. It says, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, the reason we are saved is for God's purpose, or God's plan for our lives, and the means of our salvation is God's grace. That's how we're saved. God's grace. Grace means that we don't deserve to be saved, but God saves us anyway. According to 2 Timothy 1.9, grace was given to us in Christ Jesus, listen, before time began. That, that blows my mind. Before time began? In other words, before the beginning of time, before anything else ever existed, Christ existed, and the grace that saves us pre-existed with him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 42, the first part says, uh, says that truth quite clearly. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, what does that mean? What that means is that your salvation, my salvation, listen, 
It was on the mind of God long before we ever existed. Before anything was ever created, before anything ever existed. And the thought of that ought to really fan your spiritual flame. To think that God had you and me on his mind before he ever created the world. That blows my mind. Kind of gives new thought, new meaning to that thing that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now look at verse 10. Paul points out that before time began, God had already made provision for our salvation. It says, it has now been revealed by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who has abolished death. That word abolished, it means to destroy. It means to render inoperative, to abolish. The Bible reveals in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verses 54 through 57 that when, when Christ died on the cross, it says he took the sting out of death. And that death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then it says, And thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, death, and we've, we've heard about a lot of people dying and passing away here lately. But listen, death is no longer our enemy. We don't have to fear death. Death is our friend, really, because for us, death is not the end of life. It's only the beginning of eternal life. Paul also states in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, that Jesus not only abolished death, but he also, quote, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, we didn't understand eternal life or immortality because it was unclear. It was hidden in darkness, but, but Christ brought it to light. He brought eternal life to light in order for us to see it and to understand how we can obtain it. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word light there it refers to uh, spiritual understanding. Like when we're able to comprehend something. It's like, you know, when the light bulb goes off. It's like, uh, you know, that light finally comes on and you say, oh, now I see. Because there's light. I can understand it. I can comprehend. I can comprehend it. And so Jesus turned that light on for us so that we could understand what eternal life really is and we could know how to receive eternal life. I think the life and the words of Christ contains the kingdom gospel and his life and his words penetrate our hearts and our minds and, and that brings spiritual enlightenment or understanding to us about the way of eternal life. We must review our salvation. Reflaming the flame. Rekindling the fire. Getting that spiritual flame rekindled. It requires that, that we remember our spiritual gifts. We recognize our God-given resources. We rely on the power of God and we review our salvation. So this morning, I'd like for you to search your hearts. What is it that most often causes that spiritual flame to flicker? And which of these four things do you need to do to rekindle that spiritual fire in your life?
What is it that you really need to do to become that roaring lamb? <laughs> to, to earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. To be a bold believer in Christ. And will you begin working on that today with the help of the Holy Spirit? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, as the words of Paul has been shared with us in this letter that he wrote to the young Timothy, uh, there are times in our lives, Father, when that flame begins to flicker, to fade, almost to the point of extinction, of being extinguished in our lives. But Father... I pray that uh, through the teachings of the Apostle Paul that we have learned this morning what we can do to rekindle that flame and that we'll do it with your help, with your empowering grace, with your equipping grace, with your enduring grace, that that flame would be rekindled. And then we'll stand up for what is right, what is true, according to your word. Not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of others who boldly proclaim your word. Help us to do that, Father, in our lives. Thank you for each person that's here this morning, especially for our guests. Thank you, Father, that... Uh, for those that are not here, because they're traveling, that you'd bring them back safely again. Because those that are, are sick, that uh, you'd touch them with your healing power. May we come again next week to study more on this letter that, uh, that uh, Paul wrote, the last letter before his execution. Uh, and as we share those words, that you'd teach us even more how to be strong in our faith and how to grow in our faith and how to come to uh, a faithful finish in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.